I am Dracula. Welcome to episode, what episode number is this? It's episode 638 of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. I'm your writer, host, and producer, Derek M. Cook, welcoming you either back to the show if you're a longtime listener, a returning listener, or welcoming you to the show for the very first time. Whatever the case, I'm glad you tuned in. I'm really excited about this week's episode because we've got a lot going on. Of course, we've got the main subject of the episode and we'll talk about that here in a second but we've got a look at return of ultraman through mark nasky's beta capsule review we've got kenny's look at famous monsters of filmland i have an email from a listener and the return of the weird wednesday report from jeff Pelier. and i you know this is so much to get into that i almost forgot to tell you about the music you're hearing right now this is the band frankie's chop shop this is the song go dracula go it's from their self-titled album you can find them at frankieschopshop.bandcamp.com. Frankie's is spelled F-R-A-N-K-Y-S, and then chop, chop.bandcamp.com, or look them up on Facebook, or follow the link in the show notes. There's a reason why we're playing Frankie's Chop Shop this week, and, well, I'll tell you about that at the end of this episode. So what is the main topic of conversation this time around? Well, we're welcoming back Monster Kid Radio irregular Brian Clark, we're going to talk about a movie called Beast from Haunted Cave. It's a 1959 monster gem. It's got Roger Corman's hands all over it. I love this movie. Brian loves this movie so much that he wrote a novelization of this book that is out now. There is a link in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net where you can click on a button to where you can go and buy the book directly from Amazon. But it's part of our Amazon affiliate uh, relationship with Amazon and it helps us out a little bit. If you buy the book, please consider buying the book through this particular link. Again, check it out at monsterkidradio.net. Brian's going to tell you about what he went through to write the book and of course we're going to talk about the movie itself and because I'm a fellow writer and a fellow creative and fascinated by you know, writing monster stuff, some writer talk kind of crept in to the mix as well. So stay tuned for that. Before we get to that, um, the Beta Capsule Review and Kenny's Look at Famous Monsters of Filmland and the Weird Wednesday Report, like I said, we have a piece of email from a listener by the name of Diego. Diego writes in, Good day. Just finished your last 41 episodes and I had a few comments and a question. Comment 1. Thank you for the TV horror host episode with Lord Blood Raw. As a kid growing up in Florida in the 70s, I had the ultimate horror host, Dr. Paul Bearer. I'm going to interrupt here. I've seen some video of Dr. Paul Bearer. I believe I've seen it on YouTube. I can't remember exactly where I saw it, but that looked like a lot of fun, man. I am so jealous of people who grew up with a horror host because I didn't have one. So my fandom of horror hosts comes from being a relative adult and yeah, discovering horror hosts later in life. I love them, though. I have yet to find a horror host that has complete... Mm, just so good. So good. Anyway, he continues. Thanks to Kenny for reading Famous Monsters of Filmland, issue number 144. Now I have to go and get a copy of something for myself. That's awesome. Kenny's doing the good work there. All right. Diego continues. Two. Going back a bit. I thought there was an episode where the movie Horror Express was mentioned. I just watched it and was impressed and, more importantly, enjoyed the movie. Has Horror Express ever been reviewed on Monster Kid Radio? And if so, which episode? So, Horror Express has come up in conversation, I'm sure, but specifically, episode 512, March of 2021, I had author and historian, commentarian, Troy Howard was on the show, and we talked about Horror Express. Horror Express is a movie that came out in the 70s. It is so good. It's Christopher Lee, it's Peter Cushing, it's Monsters on a Train, it's Telly Savalas, and he's awesome in it. 
So yeah, we did cover it back on episode 512. I'm sure it will come up again at some point. You know, we had Scott Glancy on the show not too long ago. He loves Horror Express, and he actually brought up Horror Express as a possible movie to talk about here on the show. But because we had talked about it at one point a couple of years back, I wanted to hold off. But yeah, Horror Express, good stuff. Episode 512. Let's finish up the email with his third point. Thank you for the show. Just started listening a few years ago, and I'm enjoying the ride. Wish you well. Diego, thank you for writing in. And I wish you the best as well. I hope you're having a great October and Halloween season so far. And I hope you continue to enjoy Monster Kid Radio, either through the archives or the new stuff that we're doing. Listeners, if you want to write in and be part of the show through listener feedback, please email me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com or call and leave me a voicemail at area code 360-524-2484. I'll go over that again at the end of the show, but that's also on our website. Again, that's monsterkidradio.net. Let's go ahead and give Frankie's Chop Shop a break. We'll get back to this song, Go Dracula Go, at the end of the episode in its entirety. But to get to that, we've got to get through everything else. And there's a lot to get to. So let's do it. For Halloween, October 13th through the 15th, Torch Song Entertainment presents Sinister Songs and Terrifying Tales. Starring Morticia, Gomez, and the rest of the Adams family. <laughs> Join Morticia and Gomez Adams and the rest of the family as they present an elegant evening of macabre tales of suspense and horror coupled with haunting tunes. Our devious duo will both terrify and seduce you with songs and stories as you enjoy specialty cocktails, appetizers, charcuterie, and desserts in an interactive cabaret-style setting. From classic creepy to kooky spooky and tongue-in-cheek, the Adams pair together tales and tunes that will usher in surprises around every dark corner. Ghoulies and ghosties lurk about, pantomiming stories by classic horror writers like Edgar Allan Poe and Washington Irving, as well as a local Portland area writer. Recommended for ages 12 and up, that's Sinister Songs and Terrifying Tales, October 13th, 14th, and 15th at Samaritan Odd Fellows Lodge in downtown Milwaukee. For more information and tickets, visit www.torchsongentertainment.com. But the room was quiet. Had it been a nightmare? What woke him? Was the candle in the antique mirror moving? Was there something standing by the curtains? Was he mad? Ah! The Crimson Cult. So terrifying they won't let us tell you about it here. And on the same bill, Horror House. A nightmare combination of shock and terror. See them together for the first time. But don't see them alone. Rated GP. Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. Return of Ultraman, Episode 31, In Between Devil and Angel. Original air date, November 5th, 1971. Captain Ibuki's daughter, Minako, visits MAT headquarters with a friend named Taro. The boy immediately strikes Go as odd, so naturally, he's tasked with looking after the children. While taking them on a tour of the facility, an alien voice speaks telepathically through the boy, identifying Ultraman 
and communicating his intent to kill him, then launch an invasion of Earth. The alien predicts that when Ultraman defeats decoy monster Pluma, he will die, and that if Go says anything, he'll be thought of as insane. Go loses it attacking Taro, which results in a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the captain, coming extremely close to divulging his biggest secret Go describes what happened, and Captain Ibuki accepts it as plausible, yet refuses to forbid his daughter from befriending Taro. Meanwhile, Pluma emerges from underneath a school, and Monster Attack Team flies to the scene where their efforts are hampered by Taro's proximity to the monster. The boy is rescued and hospitalized, but when Go pays him a visit, he responds to the alien's taunts by assaulting Taro again. Captain Ibiki orders Go to remain at headquarters, but when Pluma re-emerges as forecast by the alien, he joins the fight, although the cost may be his life and Ultraman's. Episode 31 is an exercise in suspense, most especially during the dialogue scene between Go and his captain, in which Ibiki almost puts the pieces of Go's secret identity together himself, and Go seems very close to making full disclosure. The other great buildup happens as Go must decide whether or not to transform, risking the accuracy of the alien prediction. It is rather disturbing to see our hero Go twice attempt to inflict serious harm on a child, which we know is not actually a human child, but still. That tension is a deliberate, provocative choice on the part of the show which is evidently trying to say that kids are capable of both evil and good, as suggested by the title, In Between Devil and Angel. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Mansky reporting. log, Captain James Kirk commanding. We are leaving that vast cloud of stars and planets which we call our galaxy. The question, what is out there in the black void beyond? This is Captain Kirk of the USS Enterprise. Is there anyone on board? Is there anyone on board? Have you raised anyone, Lieutenant? Nothing, sir. It is an unmanned probe which seems to be carrying a warhead. William Shatner stars as Captain Kirk, and Leonard Nimoy as science officer Spock, on Star Trek in color. The terror shock that can't be stopped. not God. You're not even human. You murdered those men and you made me a murderer too. Weird experiments of accursed scientists turn human beings into living hybrid hell monsters. Now you hold hands with the devil. Now you run. Run for your life from the terror. The torment and torture inflicted by Satan's ambassador of evil. The next victim could be you. Or you. Or you. Caught forever by the curse of the fly. Hello, Derek and the Monster Kids. This is Jeff calling in with a Weird Wednesday report. The Joy hasn't had Weird Wednesday in quite some time, and still didn't, but I was there on Wednesday the 27th of September and did see two weird movies. The first was 1953's It Came From Outer Space in glorious 3D. 
I'm not using hyperbole when I say glorious. It's some of the best 3D I've ever seen. One of my romantic partners, JJ, was with me, and she was also impressed, especially by the falling rocks and boulders. This is my second week in a row seeing a movie starring Richard Carlson and directed by Jack Arnold since the Joy had just played Creature from the Black Lagoon as a double feature with Jurassic Park. To the best of my recollection, this is my first time seeing it came from outer space. I was quite impressed. The cast is solid and the acting is good by 1953 standards. Perhaps the most recognizable face among them is the young Russell Johnson, better known later as Gilligan Island's The Professor, playing a telephone lineman and also one of the aliens in disguise. The scene around the large crater with reporters, scientists, police, and military reminded me of early in 2011 Thor when the pit created by Mjolnir's impact draws a similar crowd. I don't know what it cost to film in 3D, but I suspect much of the budget went into that process. The movie is clearly written in film to avoid as much special effects as possible. Jack Arnold did a great job working with what he had available. Nothing looks cheap, mind you, but there were clearly chances for some better looking or sounding elements. One big way they saved was by only showing shadowy glimpses of aliens at all, and those were rare. We only have one very good look at a member of their race in its own form, and even that isn't in bright light. Steven Spielberg will later use much the same trick in Jaws. One inexpensive special effect they used quite a bit was to put an inflated cover over the camera lens to distort the picture and provide us with how the aliens see. That reminded me of when viewers of Doctor Who are shown things as a dialect sees them. There are some shots, notably of people driving, that seem to be as long as they are to pad out the runtime of the movie. Overall, this is a pretty good movie, and I'd recommend it, but mostly if you can see it in 3D on a big screen. The second movie for the evening was 1990's Tremors, a movie I truly love and have seen many times, including in cinemas. The flaws of this movie are small, but do bug me. One is that sounds that no humans should be able to hear are audible to the characters. In one scene, a battery-powered radio that was in a station wagon that has been pulled completely underground can be heard by Val and Earl. Later, the humans in town can hear the gunfire from Burton and Heather's concrete-lined basement, even though it's over a mile away and, being a basement, is underground. Speaking of that station wagon, its headlights are still on even though it's been at least 12 hours since being buried. There's no way a car battery would last that long in a vehicle that isn't running. When the little girl, Mindy, is grabbed off of her pogo stick, the pogo stick stays perfectly vertical until being grabbed by a graboid. My last filmmaking problem is that no explanation is given as to why the teenage boy, Melvin, is there on his own. An unfilmed scene would reveal that his parents left him there to visit Las Vegas. Something that isn't a filmmaking problem but I just don't like is how much Val and Earl litter. They think nothing about dropping cigarettes or other trash. I agree that it's totally in character for them, I just don't like it. I had a similar problem watching Creature from the Black Lagoon the previous week when Julie Adams' character carelessly tosses a cigarette into the eponymous body of water and she should have known better. Besides those few flaws, this movie is outstanding. The writers and special effects artists team up with a truly unique monster, perhaps Hollywood's last. The movie is like an ultimate game of hot lava. Touch the ground and you die. I love how they use the principle of Chekhov's gone throughout the movie. The cliff that Val pees off at the start of the movie is the one he uses to kill the final graboid. The riding mower used to distract a graboid is seen parked by the general store earlier. The soda cooler having a noisy, faulty bearing system is shown well before its unexpected noise leads a graboid to burst through the floor. Those are just three examples. All of the residents of perfection are flawed, some perhaps deeply, but that doesn't stop our protagonist from being heroic. Perhaps the only exception to the flawed character is the non-resident, Rhonda, who is constantly turned to as the person who must have the answers because she's a grad student. That's all I have to say for now. Be good, have fun, watch monster movies.
came from outer space is a picture that you'll long remember for its blending of science and fiction, for its eerie terror, and for its story of an invasion from another planet that's almost beyond imagining. <laughs> I tell you, from its size and its appearance, this thing came from outer space. I even have reason to believe that there's some form of life in it. What do you want? What are you doing? Let me see you as you really are. Edgar Allan Poe's Tomb of Lygia. Poe considered it his masterpiece. She will not die because she willed not to die. Vincent Price, magnificent, macabre, defying the deathless, jealous spirit of Lygia. A nightmare of terror. Pitting their lust for life against the unholy powers of the undead. The undead attack the living. A wondrous world of maddening horror, starring Vincent Price in Edgar Allan Poe's Tomb of Lygia in color. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Totally Rockin' Kenny B with some feedback before today's segment. Today's movie, the low-budget, misunderstood classic Beast from Haunted Cave, was not covered in Famous Monsters. So I am going to share a segment I made for the month of Mano's Hands of Fate. I had prepared four segments, but Manos only lasted three episodes, so I put it in storage till today. It is a continuation of a theme that I thought about after I had made the segments, which I call the curse of growing up with famous monsters. Based on my narration for these four segments, you might think I have no appreciation for the misunderstood movies often celebrated on Monster Kid Radio. To some extent, that is true and I blame Famous Monsters for this lack of taste for the particular bad movies I speak about in these segments. I realize that it all has to do with expectations. What we expect from a movie often determines whether we like it or not. The curse of Famous Monsters is that it always raised our expectations for any new movie it covered. Forey would use press materials and comments from filmmakers wanting publicity to craft the articles written about films that were going to hit the screen. Together with the photos included, this would often whet our appetites for something fantastic. Our minds would imagine something even a great filmmaker could not match. And when we finally saw the movie, we sunk into great disappointment. We became tween-age cynical critics of bad cinema that had been promoted by FM because Forey made us believe we were going to love what was put on the screen. FM often failed us in this area. Today's segment is another example of how FM made us believe something great was coming to the screen that turned out to be a major disappointment. It is similar to my essay on the creeping terror, which I reference in the segment. But this is a true story. Today, like many of you, I have learned to love a cheesy movie because I enter them with low expectations. If it was used on Mystery Science Theater or made by Asylum or as a low-budget DIY or it has names like Ed Wood, Al Adamson, or Bill Rabane attached to it, I don't expect much, and often it turns out better than I imagined, and I can appreciate it. But the memories of these disappointments caused by the curse of famous monsters remain, and I share them with you today. This segment is a celebration of the cinema of aforementioned Bill Rabane. I have only seen one of his movies, but after watching the trailers from his other flicks, I am ready to take my super low expectations and give them a shot. Maybe for a laugh, or perhaps something will thrill me, as films like Manos and Beast from the Haunted Cave thrill so many monster kids. On with the trailers and today's segment. Go, go to this theater to see the science fiction picture to end all science fiction pictures. 
did he or didn't he? Is he a monster or isn't he? Only his space agency knows for sure, and they won't tell. When the capsule comes down without the astronaut, everyone is on the go, including who or what did come down. Monster a go-go. Here's the picture that grabs the screen and shakes it. The picture that makes you wonder if the Earth is coming to an end right in the theater in front of you. Never in your life have you seen such a combination of happy, sad, good, bad, rock'em, sock'em action. When you walk out, you wonder what you've seen, because never has there been a motion picture like this. Monster a go-go, with a genuine ten-foot-tall monster to give you the whim whams Monster a go-go, with astronauts and space capsules and pretty girls, and cosmic radiation and pretty girls, and screams and pretty girls. There's something for everyone in the picture they're all talking about, the picture with go. Monster a go-go. Was it Arak? Was it Arak? One man's obsession turns the cold north into a blazing battlefield. The Capture of Bigfoot, not a documentary. The Capture of Bigfoot, now playing at a theater near you, rated PG. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. This month, we are taking a closer look at the misunderstood classic, Mano's Hands of Fate. This film was never covered by FM, but it wasn't because Foray was shy about featuring misunderstood films. In fact, the pages of FM were filled with photos and articles of any movie that wanted to promote itself and famous monsters. This month, we will take a look at several of them and see how FM sung their praises, most of the time sight unseen. My encore essay for Creeping Terror was made up. The article came out of the year I was born. But I was inspired by my actual reaction to a film covered in FM 127 from August of 1976. In it was a preview of the all-star giant spider invasion. Its five pages and seven photos whetted the appetite of this lover of all things giant monsters. And I was thrilled to go see it. I never forget sitting in the Valley River Twin Theater in Eugene, Oregon, mouth open in astonishment at the horror of filmmaking I was watching. Craig and I could not believe it, and our 12-year-old critical minds panned the film like a 49er pans for gold. What a disappointment. I didn't rip up my copy of FM 127, but I was tempted. Fortunately, all was not lost, as the second feature was the Saul Bass weirdly atmospheric classic, Phase 4, about super-intelligent ants. Let's hear how FM trick me into wanting to see the travesty that is the giant spider invasion. When plans were made to film the giant spider invasion, Chicago-based special effects man Bob Millay was contracted by Group 1 to create the crawling monstrosity. An agreement was reached and the delivery date for one giant spider was set. All too soon, filming began in the backwoods of Gleason, Wisconsin. Six weeks of actual shooting. And the day arrived when Bob was to bring his super prop. According to Brandon L. Chase, president of Group 1, when Bob was met at the airport, he arrived with only two luggage-sized suitcases and no giant spider. Panic set in. We had a set shooting schedule, and each day's delay cost enormous amounts of money. Bob assured everyone that the situation was under control. He explained that it was impossible for him to travel with a 50-foot spider, which, when completed, would weigh five tons. Arriving at the farmhouse set, Bob Millay asked for aluminum tubing, wire mesh, and other raw materials which were all available at the local junkyards. Then he revealed his enormous, detailed plans for building the giant spider. He hadn't been kidding. In four days, with the help of ten people working 24 hours, the special effects genius built two giant spiders using second-hand parts from plumbing supply houses and junkyards. Steel beams were used for the framework, and wire mesh encased the driver sitting in a Volkswagen chassis. The eight legs, each 15 to 18 feet long, were composed of steel tubing with a man inside each leg, needed to move each leg independently for a realistic effect when crawling. 
The spider's fur was taken from fake fur coat material, so when a breeze would blow, the fur would ripple realistically. Bob Millay also performed some stunts in the film, such as racing a motorcycle into flames and crashing a car into a gasoline station. Many stunts are more dangerous than they look. For instance, when the spider blew up at the end of the film, two crewmen were hospitalized because they stood too close and suffered severe burns. According to Joseph Mass, international advertising manager for Group 1, real tarantulas were used in certain portions of the film. They had to be trucked from Arizona, since airlines don't allow this type of transportation. At great expense, they had to also be kept warm. The special effects men were responsible for the trucking. How does one direct spider actors? Interestingly, spiders are made to move by directing jets of compressed air in the desired direction. Harmless to spiders. At the end of the picture, the giant spider was destroyed, but two were built. The other one is being kept in storage. Anyone need a 50-foot spider? That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next time. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. The Alpha Incident. A motion picture to penetrate the inner boundaries of your mind. The Alpha Incident. I've never seen anything like this before. Well, that's a reasonable remark. Cut the crap, Jim. A frightening story of four men and one woman caught in the nightmare of secrecy, forced to face their own worst fears. If she had any sense, she'd be fast asleep. The asleep. Alpha oh. Incident. I wonder if she ever ran those mazes. You know, I always fall for the intellectual type. What the hell happened here? The Alpha Incident. The only time I stay in one spot this long is when I'm in bed with a chick or when I'm just sleeping. The Alpha Incident. A most unusual science fiction thriller. Where does science fiction end and science fact begin? Five people. You will never know until you see the Alpha Incident. Only a handful of people knew the truth. And there was only one ultimate solution. The Alpha Incident. A drama so horribly close to the truth, it will blow your mind. And the man who found this little is a small country town, proud of him. like and many others, want to thank him with, this celebration. with a dreadful Remember secret. Him because he's done good. 200 years ago, it was the scene of unspeakable evil and satanic brutality. Now the demons have come back to haunt <laughs> Every time the harmonium plays, another victim is slaughtered. Don't worry, this won't hurt the bit. Dare you unleash the demons of Ludlow? This is Count Dracula. And I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited. And occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. You know how the children of the night, ah, I mean monster kids, can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned. And don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky Van Helsing. Listeners, I'd like to welcome back to the show. You know, I start every conversation with somebody that comes on the show with this. You all heard me at the beginning of the episode say who's going to be here. It's Brian Clark, Monster Kid Radio Irregular, fellow author. Welcome back to the show, man. Oh, thank you so much for uh, for having me back again. And just hot on the heels of Frankenstein Conquers the World. And the first time I'm here yeah. talking not about a kaiju thing. That's right. 
Yeah. Are you going to be able to handle it? How are we going to handle not hearing the screonk in the background <laughs> and everything? I uh, will make do. We'll make do. We'll make yeah. do. We'll make do. Well, you know, we got a decent monster to talk about anyway. Maybe not as big, but still kind of cool. It is very cool. I like it a lot. So do I. You know, I've watched this movie a lot over the past several years for a number of different reasons. Sometimes just because I like watching it. Uh, not because I'm talking about it on the show. Not because I'm using it for inspiration for something that I'm working on. It's a fun one. And we're talking about the movie Beast from Haunted Cave. Break trail with four men and a girl to the territory of the four men who live by killing. A girl who has experienced so much that only sadistic brutality can thrill her. Vicious and violent men attempting the most daring of daylight robberies, enjoying midnight revelries until one orgy turns into... A nightmare of terror. Ride the ski lift to the very top in thrills. What I saw, you wouldn't believe. Watch men who deal in death, meet and fight. The invincible beast from haunted cave. It's pretty darn cool. It's from 1959. It came out of Film Group, which was Roger Corman's group. They were responsible for a handful of, well, I'm going to call them classics, whether or not they appear on those 50 packs from Mill Creek or not. I'm going to call them classics. (laughs) A number of movies came from Film Group before he moved on to doing other things and working for other people. This isn't Corman directed, and technically I don't think he's even credited as a producer, is he? No, he. this one is credited to Gene, although there are varying reports of Roger's involvement behind the scenes. I think he probably did more than his fair share on this one, but he was busy directing another movie at the time they were making this, so he couldn't be around the whole time. And this is a monster movie set in the Black Hills of South Dakota, actually shot on location, Mm. which is kind of cool. Granted, they were out there shooting something else kind of concurrently around the same time, and Roger Corman being the uh, budget-conscious director that he was. Uh (laughs) penny pinching director filmmaker that he was you know he got the people up there he got the crew up there let's shoot another movie and uh, we'll put a monster in it and there you go that other movie being ski troop but hack which also features michael forrest who's uh-huh. the lead of beast from haunted cave who's great by the way i yeah. love michael forrest i've had a chance to meet him a couple of times over the years it's been a while i'm sure he doesn't remember meeting me but i've met him a few times he's a big dude now i'm a big dude but michael forrest is a big dude he is Fun. imposing a large man uh, and uh, it was pretty intimidating to meet the guy then he holds his own in this film like i said he's one of the leads in this probably the lead in this the protagonist the good guy gill the ski instructor who is getting involved in some shenanigans with some folks that he doesn't know are well thieves yeah <laughs> and that's one of the things i love about this movie is that it's it's a heist movie it's a monster movie put them together you got some magic why do you like this one so much? Well, like you said, the the location shooting, it kind of an unusual setting. It's not an unusual setting for a monster movie and that you would expect it to be a Bigfoot movie, but it's kind of an unusual setting for a cave monster spider creature movie <laughs> being shot in South Dakota in the dead of winter. So it has kind of a a unique vibe to it, I guess. It really does, especially when you look at the other things that Corman and company were doing at this time. You know, Roger Corman's known for just cranking them out, filling the drive-ins with awesome flicks. Some of the other Corman films that I absolutely love are things like The Wasp Woman or Mm. Bucket of Blood and some of these other things. You know, I love the terror, right or wrong. I love the terror. Another movie that was shot incredibly conscious or budget conscious. Uh, But this one... It has that unique monster in it. Mm -hmm. It's got the, everybody's trapped in a location, ship in a bottle kind of story. It's got the heist stuff going on. I used to say this when I was doing the zombie movie podcast, that the best zombie movies aren't about the zombies, it's about the people dealing with the zombies. Mm -hmm. And this one has some really cool uh, character interactions. It does, yeah. While they're dealing with the fact that there's a monster about. Something about this one in particular, but pretty much any Corman movie is they're always a little better than they need to be. 
even though if he was primarily, you know, budget conscious uh, and was just wanting to make product, he couldn't stop being a good craftsman. I don't know that it was even necessarily a conscious thing, but he was so good at choosing the right people for the jobs. And when, you know, he found someone like Charles Griffith, who wrote the script for this, wrote tons of scripts for him. He knew that worked. He was fast and good. In fact, this is kind of based on another Griffith script, the uh, Corman movie that he directed in 57 called Naked Paradise. When they were getting ready to write this one, Roger just said, give me Naked Paradise again, but put it in a gold mine with a blizzard instead of a hurricane and give me a monster. <laughs> Griffith went, okay. Yeah. And, you know, a few days later, here here we are. But the, the actors all put in really good performances. Like I said, the unique location, the monster is very odd. It was originally supposed to be uh, made by Paul Blaisdell, but he was so tired of the cheapo treatment he was getting even with AIP, and this was that much cheaper that, you know, they, they told him what the budget was going to be, and he just told them to kick rocks and left. <laughs> they wanted nothing to do with that. Yeah, for Blaisdell to say that's not enough money. <laughs> yeah. So it was made by uh, Chris Robinson. He was a actor, a stuntman, and a special effects guy. He was a model maker. He approached the the Carmen brothers and um, said that he had seen or heard other sci-fi horror films that with monster costumes that he thought he could do better, and so he wanted it wanted his shot, and, and so they gave it to him. Once he got the check that for his materials that he could afford to buy, I'm guessing he probably understood why he thought all those other monsters could have been done better. It's interesting in that the monster is super unique. You see it in best detail on the movie poster as nice. with the case with a lot of Roger Gorman productions you know you start with the poster and then you kind of go from there or the poster is more uh, exploitive or, or graphically representative of what they may have what the, the monster to look like there's that scene in Ed Wood you know the Johnny Depp Tim Burton film mm -hmm. where Ed Wood's getting hired to do a movie and you know do you have a script no but I got a poster you know and this this is something that Hammer Films would do as well, many times, putting the poster and the art together before doing anything for the film or the script. I love the poster for this, but the monster in this case, I think, is even cooler than what we see on the poster. And that, that's something else that adds to the the strange vibe of this movie. You could tell they wanted it to be a spider because you've got the, the spider webs floating around in the air and all over the inside of the cave. And it has kind of arachnoid legs. But the body kind of looks like the salt vampire from the Star Trek episode, The Man Trap. It doesn't really look yep. like a spider. <laughs> it's just this very yeah. strange, kind of surreal, almost dreamlike. Like it's a monster that you would see in a nightmare. And then you wake up in the morning and go, what? It was kind of a spider, but not really... You're not wrong. I think part of it feeling like that has to do with the fact that sometimes the special effects don't always hold up. They mm -hmm. do this weird kind of superimposition of the monster almost looking kind of transparent. And I, I don't know if that was on purpose or not. If it was on purpose, kudos on them. If it wasn't on purpose, well, happy accident because it makes it seem even more surreal. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it seem like it might be a ghost. And I almost wonder if they were doing that to try to make it seem bigger than it really was, too. Yeah. That if the suit standing next to, like you were saying, how Michael Forrest is such a big dude, that if they just put the creature suit next to him, like, why is he even scared of it? He could just beat this thing up. <laughs> so maybe they were trying to blow its image up a little bit to make it seem like it was a more of a threat. That, that could very well be. That could very well be. You know, you mentioned Star Trek, Michael Forrest. I think most people, if, if they haven't watched a lot of, you know, Euro spy films or Westerns, things like that, he was Apollo in that one episode of Star Trek, classic Star Trek. And, it was a, and yeah, he did appear bigger in that than he is in real life, but, uh, <laughs> but he is an imposing guy. Just looking at that guy, you can kind of tell he's a big dude. Uh, but I do like that kind of transparent, surreal kind of look with the monster. Now towards the end, he's a lot more solid or it's a lot more solid really kind of allows you to let your imagination run wild about why it's like that. Is it something that is intentional in the film? Was it not? Is it only solid when it's in its haunted cave? I, I don't know. I just, I really dig it. Sometimes the accidents are happy accidents. Like 
Like you were yeah. saying, maybe if they did it on purpose or not, it works. It just adds to the movie. It, it does. The The best part of the movie, though, for me, I love the monster, but I love the interaction of the characters, what they're doing in this. I love the storytelling happening here. It's such a unique blend of characters. I just really am drawn to a story like this, and I, I don't know what that says about me, but I love the setup. I love the heist gone wrong. Are some of the characterizations a little broad? Sure. You know, there's the, the one party guy and, you know, Gypsy seems to fall in love with our hero pretty darn fast. Mm-hmm. But maybe that's, I don't know. They named her Gypsy and she does seem to wander quite a bit. Uh, read into that, whatever you want. Uh, but uh, do you remember the first time you saw this movie? Yeah, uh, yeah. I was in college and I picked up one of those uh, multi-movie I think it was this and the Wasp Woman. It was a double feature disc. It was something just cheap at the Best Buy near the uh, college I went to and uh, mm-hmm. took it back to the dorm room and watched it with my roommate. And, and that was that? Yeah. I don't remember the first time I saw it. I'm sure it was in one of those collections. I'm just, It had to have been one of those collections, you know, the, the Mill Creek sets. I keep saying Mill Creek, but they certainly weren't the only company that was putting out 10 movies to a disc or five movies to a disc. So it, it doesn't necessarily look the cleanest sometimes the transfers didn't really hold up i think there's a decent transfer of this available online now i don't know if anybody's really gone through the trouble of restoring this do you know if it's ever been released on blu-ray uh, yeah it actually is it's either up for pre-order or it just came out there's a company whose name escapes me right now who's been doing like really nice upgraded transfers uh, uh high def transfers of these public domain movies They've done the the two Ray Kellogg movies, uh, Giant Gila Monster and Killer Shrews. They've done Beast from Haunted Cave, I know, is one of them. I forget some, but they've got, I don't know, probably a good half dozen titles out at least. And, they, you know, they have commentary tracks. I think Courtney Joyner's worked on some of them. The Monster Party guys have done a commentary for them. Um, but yeah, so they are out there in, in nice, cleaned up versions. And the, the version of this that I watched on YouTube isn't dreadful quality. The, the worst part of it is probably the sound, which... yeah provided some interesting challenges to me for reasons we'll get into <laughs> in a little bit, I, I suppose. So as we're talking here, I went and I checked it. And it's uh, Film Masters is the group putting it together. Yes. And they do have that two-disc double feature coming of Beast from Haunted Cave with Ski Troop Attack, which, great, perfect. You know, it's got the South Dakota collection, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but as of right now, you can pre-order it for 20 bucks, 1999 which is pretty cool and it looks like you know they did a, their best to clean it up and make it look good so yeah and and it's nice that they put some extra features on these because like the all these public domain movies anybody can throw out the worst quality copy on that and 20 other movies on one disc and and they're they're terrible so you would think you wouldn't have much impetus to to spend 20 bucks on a blu-ray of it but then you get a commentary track or maybe a little documentary or something some some added value to it. and i love that stuff like extra features tend to be the deciding factor on whether or not i will shell out for either a, new, a movie i don't already have or especially upgrading something that i've already got on a different format but if there's new, sure. new extras if there's a chance for me to learn something about the movie that i didn't know already then i'll i'll spend the money same here i've been slowly cutting back on my stuff. I've got a lot of stuff here. When I moved, I realized I've got too much. So I've been selling a few things off on eBay here and there, but uh, I sell like that physical media. Oh, and, yeah. you know, I think I'll be adding this to the old Christmas wish list. <laughs> <laughs> comes out later this month, you know, uh, towards the end of October, which works out well because I know something else that's coming out this month. Uh, that is related to the beast from haunted cave. And we're going to talk it. about that. Uh, here in a sec, I, I do want to say just briefly, if you haven't seen this movie, we're spoiling it. Obviously, you know, Count Dracula gave you the spoiler at the beginning of this conversation. And I think we pretty much inadvertently talked about the story. There's a heist going on. There's a ski instructor who's not involved in the heist. A monster turns up. Hijinks ensue. <laughs> it's not a very heavy plot. The title gives the game away. You're not going to really be surprised does. that there's a beast in a movie called The Beast from Haunted Cave. <laughs> Talking a little bit about uh, the performances like we were earlier, and you mentioned Gypsy. I think she's the standout of the movie. I think Sheila Newton yeah. was fantastic, and there's not much information about her. She didn't do very many movies. 
Michael Forrest did mention in an interview, I think with Tom Weaver, that she seemed to have a lot of demons following her around, but you know, he didn't really elaborate on that. And it's a shame that she didn't do more, but I think maybe those demons that were following her around in real life helped translate to the screen because everyone in this movie does, like we were saying earlier, does a little better than is just needed to be, even if their character's kind of broad, like the performances are all pretty good. But mm -hmm. when Gypsy is lamenting her broken life and in several of her scenes, Sheila Newton makes you feel the the pain, the regret in her voice. Like that character is alive and you can tell there's more depth to her. I just love her performance. I think she's fantastic in this. It's it's one of those characters that I know I kind of said earlier, she does seem to fall in love with Gil pretty darn quick. But you can still tell there's a depth there. How did she get involved with these people? Some of these people are just bad people. They're, they're bad men. They're, they're thieves. They're potential killers or killers. They're, they're not nice folk. I don't feel like Gypsy is cut from that same cloth. She just kind of got herself wrapped up in this somehow yeah. and has some regrets. And like you said, some darkness, some demons to her. So I do like the performance a lot. I don't fault her performance for the falling in love with Gil real quick. Problem. But in a movie that's an hour or long, there's not that much time to... For sure, for sure. I think, she, I agree with you. I think she's a standout in this. She's really good. I like her relationship uh, to the other criminals uh, with, uh, was it uh, Alexander Ward who plays kind of like the ringleader? Uh, yeah, yeah. Frank Wolf is the actor who plays Alex. I'm sorry. Yeah, Frank, Alex. <laughs> Sorry, got that wrong. Yeah, Frank Wolf is the actor. Alexander Wolf's the ringleader. Yeah, I liked him too. I thought he, he was a great villain. Yeah. His mustache just needed to be a little bit longer so he could twirl it, but he was a great <laughs> villain. Yeah, he, he is a good scumbag. And the the other two guys, Smith and Jones, as they call them, <laughs> um, are interesting. Smith is almost a Brooklyn guy, but not kind of, sort of, <laughs> but he's like the comic relief. And he's kind of this just uh -huh. weird little man child. Yeah. And Jones is kind of a, he's probably, he's maybe the, the, the weakest just because his character is just a kind of tough, silent thug type guy and doesn't yeah. have a lot of room to stretch, but. Well, you kind of need that kind of character in a, in a heist movie as part of the gang, you know? Yeah. And I keep saying heist movie. It's not like an Ocean's Eleven or anything like that. There's a a scheme to break in and steal some gold and to distract the authorities and kind of get away with it. They plant a bomb in a cave somewhere that draws everybody out so they can kind of do what they're going to do and fly out before anything gets connected to them. I may have given away way more than the movie, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fun setup. I really like Michael Forrest in this a lot. There's just something charismatic about the man. He was a great actor. The script is about as strong as the script is going to be. That was something that was <laughs> repurposed from a movie set in what, Hawaii. So, you know, you repurpose the script, do what you got to do. I like the direction in this a lot. You said they end up being better or trying harder than they need to or being better than they need to. Monty Hellman, this is his first film, and he would go on to do some really interesting work. Uh, I'm, I'm glad he did this because it gave it a, a polish or a look that maybe the movie didn't deserve, but I still dig it. Yeah, that all started because he, uh, Roger lost some money on on a, a play that he was, of Monty's that he was funding. <laughs> I was waiting for Godot. And uh, the, the people who owned the theater that they were putting it on at decided to sell the theater and shut it down so the play didn't get to have its full run, so the money Roger put up was lost. And Hellman said, well, I, I thought I'd better pay him the money back by doing some films for him. And you can just imagine the look on Roger Corman's face when he hears someone say they owe him a favor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't to say he did it for free. He did get paid a little bit, but it's still... Uh, I, he, he may have not gotten paid as much as he otherwise could have, but who knows? Yes. <laughs> Emphasis on paid a little bit. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure a lot of the money went back into the production, too. You're shooting in not necessarily the most uh, pleasant or hospitable of conditions. You know, you're in the, in the winter or in the snow in South Dakota, not necessarily known for, 
you know, a, a bustling film industry at the time, I'm sure. No, they were, uh, in fact, part of the reason was because they did not enforce, uh, union rules uh, because these, these yeah. were not union movies. <laughs> they, they were not. And, uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to leave it at that. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely it's... a union guy, but, uh, a lot of these movies were not <laughs> union mm-hmm. productions. They, uh, it is what it is at this point, but. You know, I again, I dig the story. I like the the music's a little silly, but I love the music too. You know, I'm a music guy, so I'm going to pay attention to that sort of thing. And I dug that. Uh, I like the monster design a lot for what it is. You never really know what it is, which makes it even more kind of fun and interesting. And I want to know how somebody watches a movie like this with its sometimes transparent monster or broadly written characters and says, you know what? I want to turn this into a book. How does that happen? That that person would have to be crazy. <laughs> well, uh, we're talking about the upcoming book release that you've got coming up, and I yeah, I want to hear all about how you came up with it and, and all of that. Yeah, well, I have always loved movie novelizations. I have quite a few of them. Uh, <laughs> I, I enjoy reading them, and it's something. As I've been a writer for a long time, and I've always wanted to do one, and. I kind of never knew how you broke into that. And then I saw several other people over the, in recent years, having done novelizations of public domain movies and thought, well, now that's an idea. (laughs) I'm going to do that myself. And, uh, I, I, I kind of just, you know, put some movies in a titles in a hat, reached it in and grabbed one. And that was, you know, not exactly that. (laughs) I didn't really have a hat with titles in but I just kind of picked Beast from Haunted Cave because it's it was one that I, I've always liked. Um, it's fairly short, so it would be a a good uh, starting point, I guess, to kind of learn a little bit about the form and uh, kind of figure out the mechanics of it before I tackled something bigger than mm-hmm. that. And it's a brief movie. There's not a, a ton of character development, so there was a little bit of room to add things. Which um, also became a bit tricky because the length wasn't there. So it's not a terribly thick uh, book. I did a little making of piece to put in the back of it to add some a little bit of extra value to it. That's what I was talking about earlier when I said the the sound quality on the print on YouTube isn't very good because, to my knowledge, there isn't a, a script of this out there anywhere. So I wrote the novelization by just watching the movie in very tiny chunks over and over again on YouTube and transcribing the whole thing. Oof. And there were moments where I had to turn the volume on my laptop all the way up and stick my head right next to the speaker to try to figure out <laughs> what someone was saying because the sound was so blown out. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. I think it turned out pretty well. Um, and so it is, it's out on Amazon now. And uh, I, the, I'd been working on this for a while I'd been pecking away at it here and there for probably about a year. And I'm going to be tabling with my short story collection at a horror convention called Halloween of Palooza in Ottumwa, Iowa, coming up here in October. And uh, decided, well, that's my deadline. I want to have two books on my table. I'm going to finally finish this thing and get it out there. Having a deadline is a heck of a motivator. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've dealt with that myself. There is a, an upcoming uh video coming up on the Team Death YouTube channel where I'm going to talk about how that resulted in my superhero novel earlier this year. So I I totally understand that, empathize and applaud that because it is, it's hard, man, to sit down and and crank something out like that with a deadline looming. Even if your deadline is not for like six months a year, just knowing you've got to get it done could sometimes put some pressure on you as a creative. I get it going through and listening to the script and the dialogue and the screenplay. Since it's such a short movie, did you find that you had to fill some stuff in? I did, yeah. So I added, there, there's a prologue that takes place back before the settlement of Deadwood, South Dakota. Oh, and okay. I, I kept it vague as to what the creature was. I, I didn't want to go in and say, okay, this is what it is. It's a demon or it's an ancient monster or yeah, you know, I, I threw a couple of different options out there, um, but I tried to put a little bit in. 
I know this is a tricky thing, especially these days. I didn't want to come off as, you know, dumb white guy trying to talk about Native American stuff. So I didn't get real in depth with it, but I, I tried to weave a little bit of the Lakota mythology of Iktomi, uh, which is a spider god. Okay. Uh, uh, sort of a trickster, like their version of Loki, but it's a giant spider. Um, Interesting. So there's okay. a little bit of talk about that in there um, because they do have a Native American character in the movie, Small Dove, who doesn't get much to do, unfortunately. But uh, so I, I and I added a little bit of internal monologue to the characters to try to give them a little bit more development. So uh, when Smith and Small Dove kind of develop this little relationship while they're at the cabin, I elaborated a little bit on that. Um, I tried to get in Gypsy's head a little bit more, giving some history about her uh, relationship with Alex, how they wound up together, how things went sour. That's really where I add. I didn't add a lot of extra action or anything. It was more character stuff, I suppose. I did try to spiff the monster up a little bit. Um, I, I didn't get real specific in the description, but you know, I, I tried to make it more maybe what, Robinson and company saw in their heads rather than what they wound up getting on the screen. So it does have a little bit more, uh, spider attributes to it, like, uh, multifaceted eyes and, and big gnarly fangs with venom and things like that. But oh, okay, maybe I'm giving too much of the shop away. No, no one's going to have any reason to read the book. <laughs> I think people should read the book, darn it. And again, as a fellow creative, I know sometimes it's hard to write the other. So trying to to walk that line between, you know, how much do we really talk about the Native American possible connections and that sort of thing? <laughs> it's an issue. And it's certainly that's something that came up in even the films that we love from this, this era. You know, they try real hard to, to ha include yeah. these characters, but you can tell it's just some white guy writing it, you know, and, the, and they don't know. The, the, so, yeah. Uh, there, there is one moment where when they first get to Gil's cabin, uh -huh. Smith sees small dove and has this stupid freak out where he runs around yelling that he's going to be scalped and it's just this really embarrassingly racist moment and i did try to add a little bit of the other characters sort of sheepishly apologizing for his yeah <laughs> inappropriate behavior you know try, trying to ameliorate the racism a little bit i guess yeah that was uh it's uh that part is a little cringy <laughs> yeah it was one of those when i got to that part uh, watching the movie and, and doing the transcription I thought oh I don't remember this how am I going to get around this yeah right <laughs> like I don't want to just straight up put this in the book because I don't want to condone it but it's still part of the movie so where can we go with it that you know just kind of stepping gingerly around that part I guess yeah exactly exactly how gruesome do you get because the things that happen, and, and I'm not asking you to give away parts of the story or whatever, but because of the time and because what they could show on screen and the technology involved in the budget and all that, some of the characters get wrapped up in webs and there's talk of blood being drained and that sort of thing. How do you handle a sequence like that? That didn't really change very much um, because it's a classic movie, because of the era it's from and what was allowed on screen. You're saying, I wasn't interested in turning this into some sort of gory effects filled 1980s splattery exploitation movie thing i wanted to keep it pretty true to the the feel of the film so yeah there's some talk of that there's blood being drank but a lot of it is done with describing sucking sounds or oh. something like you know I, I i i yeah i think that kind of stuff is creepier anyway if you're if you're trying to be horrific which i don't think anyone's going to read this book and have a hard time sleeping that night but um, but yeah, I, I wasn't about to change the tone of, because if someone is going in to read a novelization of a classic horror film, <laughs> they're really going to be turned off if it's, if it's a splatter punk story, you know what I mean? Sure. So no, I, and, and there's no, I think there might be one swear word in the whole thing. You know, I, I, I kept all the language just as it was. I transcribed the dialogue pretty much straight up. So there's nothing in this that's going to offend anyone, I hope. Did you keep it the same time period in which the film was produced? I don't know if the film ever says, it is now 1959 and we're in South Dakota. I don't think they ever do that or anything like that. But do you keep it kind yeah. of set in this nebulous pseudo 50s, 60s time frame? 
Yeah, there there isn't really anything in the movie that gives away the time. And so I didn't really make any reference to that in the story because most of it's spent at a cabin anyway. Mm -hmm. I guess there is one reference to, um, because they they do spend a lot of time sitting around listening to the radio. So I did describe the radio as being made out of Bakelite, that sort of 1950s plastic Mm. type material. Okay, okay. So I suppose that kind of gives it away. But other than that, there isn't really, you know, no one brings out a cell phone or anything like that. Yeah, that's the the conceit, I think. Well, even modern horror movies or, or monster stories now have to get around the fact that everybody's had a cell phone. So <laughs> yeah, that's always a thing, right? Uh huh. So the, I guess since the time period wasn't that important in the in the movie, it wasn't important to the to the book either. And speaking of 1959, I I feel like spirit of honesty. I need to call myself out. Oh here. no. So to to give. Oh no! Uh, see, you told to me give, you were going to do this too, and I was like, I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, we'll see. I don't. You know. <laughs> All right, good, but you brought it up, so go ahead. To add a little extra material to the book, since I do a lot of writing for Scream Magazine, do, doing uh, behind-the-scenes articles on the making of movies and things, I did a little making of the Beast from Haunted Cave article to put in the back of the book. And as I was bringing that up, so to use as sort of notes for the for the discussion, I was scrolling through it and happened to notice that I made an error, which is what happens when you're your own editor and you stare at the same text dozens of times before you go to print that I said that the movie was made in 1960 and it was made in 1959. So there it is, uh, you know, fake fan. Oh no. <laughs> I'm, I'm a phony. How dare you? I apologize, but I think I know, but I think that's the only mistake. So. Well, actually, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you can fix it for future editions. I can. Yeah. Yes. It's, uh, that's one of these days I'll go back in and it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we talk about, you know, being your own editor and that sort of thing. That's that's one of the nice things about being able to do our own thing now as indie publishers, right? We can go on and if we want to make a change, we can make a change. It's not that hard to do. So, mm-hmm. right. Uh, Godzilla knows I've done it many times with my own work. I mean, I've never made a mistake that that wrong, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'll be honest with you. Even before. I knew Steve Sullivan, who's done a couple of these types of books before as well, or The Devil Bat Diaries, which was a novelization of The Devil Bat that was done even before then. I always thought, wouldn't it be cool to go on and do a novelization of a public domain book? But I've never really felt confident enough to pull it off because there are going to be people who love these movies. There are going to be fans of these films. Is that something that you found yourself, I hate to use the word, but struggling with? Like making sure you're servicing the fans of the film, or or you is that something that was important to you, or you just focus on making it your book, your your version of the story? How do you proceed on that? No, it, it was is in my mind as like as I was saying before about the not making it any more gruesome or anything. I wanted to make it something that would hopefully meet the expectations of fans of the movie because let's face it. The only people who are going to want to read this are fans of The Beast from Haunted Cave. I can't imagine anyone who doesn't know this movie going, <laughs> oh, well, sure, I'll read a novelization of this old monster movie that I haven't seen. So I hope it's something that people like. And But that's part of being a writer is, you know, you got to have a thick skin. Not everyone is going to like your stuff, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but I hope people like it. Uh, I, I did my best, I think. Um, I didn't try to change it too much and make it much of my own story. I, I wanted to preserve the feel of the film and uh, I'm looking forward to doing the next one or whatever that may be. I've got a few ideas kicking around in my head. Oh yeah? But I think I know what I'm going to do next. Uh oh. Yeah. Do, do, do you See but if I, I can't say it because then somebody will go oh well I'm just going to do that one beforehand because I'm kind of a slow writer. <laughs> <laughs> but there are plans. There are plans yes. Okay. Alright. Now you've got the event coming up the convention where you're going to be tabling with it as well where and when is that that is uh october 13th and 14th in otumwa iowa it's called halloween palooza um on friday night we're going to have a little author panel with myself and a few other local authors where we're each going to read either an excerpt from a novel or maybe a short story i think the host said we had 10 or so minutes a piece so i'll probably read a story out of my short story collection uh for that but and I'll be there with, with books on the table, I hope. 
I hope they get here in time. They're supposed to arrive the Tuesday before we leave. <laughs> so Amazon's cutting it a little close with their delivery dat- times. But, yeah, so. it's a thing, right? So Halloween, Halloween, a palooza. Halloween, I can't, why can't I say the word? Halloween, a palooza. It's kind go. of a mouthful. Halloween, yeah. <laughs> gosh, I can't. You know what? I've had one cup of coffee today so far. I think I need much more. Part of the 13th, Saturday the 14th, Halloween. I can't say it. <laughs> Halloweenapalooza.com. There will be a link in the show notes. <laughs> oh, man. Looks like they're doing a lot over there. Uh, let's see. You're going to be tabling there, but are you going to take a time to watch any of the movies or get involved in any of that stuff? Uh, if I can, I usually like to catch up with the film festival when they're there and uh they're they're gonna have some good guests this year they got tom matthews lar park lincoln uh, a bunch of people from several friday the 13th movies um and i would like to catch the panel and and uh that they're doing but i'm not sure i'll be able to because i don't want to ditch my partner terry to watch the table the whole time while i'm off gallivanting around the <laughs> convention so probably i'll be at the table most of the time that i'm not doing my own panel but isn't that why you bring somebody with you to these things and make him sit at the table so you can go off and play <laughs> it would be an uncomfortable car ride home if i did that to her <laughs> i'm looking at the guest list here too and you know i've mentioned this before uh in my history as a horror fan i i came up watching you know movies from the 80s and that sort of thing too i love the friday the 13th movies i really do so this is cool and tom matthews i've seen do a number of interviews i heard him do interviews over the years and our park Lincoln is just awesome. So I, I hope you have a chance to at least partake of a little bit. But most importantly, I hope you have a successful uh, tabling experience. And I hope plenty of people come by and pick up your books. If you're in the area, folks, Thank you, you got to go check out. You got to support, you know, one of ours. You got to support these monster kids doing this monster kid stuff, especially as we get more and more into quote unquote classics being considered things like Friday the 13th or something like that. And that's fine. But to see monster kids who love the real classics, the stuff from the 40s and 50s and 60s, putting out material for people like us, I I just want people to support you, Brian, is what I'm getting at. And I hope the listeners can feel that and we'll be able to do that. This call to action, you know. If people wanted to pick up an autographed copy of the book, will you be signing it at the con? I will, yes. Yep. And uh, you can track me down on Facebook if for for some inexplicable reason you uh, want my autograph. (laughs) I will have physical copies I can mail out from, from home. But, uh, but yes, I, any, any time I'll do an appearance at a convention or something like that, I'll have copies to sign. That was my next question is how people can get it if they cannot make it to the convention. Like I know I'm not gonna be able to make it out there. The easiest way is through Amazon. Uh, they'll get it to you quicker than I can, but, uh, and I have an author page there that's got, uh, got this new one. It's got the beast from Hanukkah. cave. It's got uh, my short story collection, putting the ground to sleep and other weird tales and hopefully soon to be many more of these novelizations and more original stories too. So I know you don't want to mention any more novelizations just yet because, you know, you don't want somebody else to to do it. Not that somebody would like coming in and swoop in and they'd have the exclusive rights to do a public domain film or anything, but I understand, you know, you want to. True. There's room for everyone's version out there, I suppose. There's always room for one more good one. That's how I've always felt about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Non-public domain adaptations. Is there anything coming up? either fiction-wise or for Scream Magazine or anything that you want to talk about? The last issue of Scream Magazine that uh, is on the stands now, I've got two pieces in, one on The Mummy's Tomb and one on Life Force, the magnificently weird Toby Hooper film, which I absolutely love. And uh, in the current issue that's up for pre-order, I don't have anything, but there are still plenty of articles they have for me waiting yet to be published. So there will be more on the horizon there. And as far as novelizations, fingers crossed, no comment. (laughs) Oh, well, that was another kind of impetus for for wanting to do one of these public domain ones is to have a kind of a calling card to where if I went to a bigger convention where one of these new Blu-ray labels say, well, they're not new label, but uh, newly getting into novelizations, we'll say like Severin, for example, I could hand their representative copy and say, hey, if uh, if you guys need somebody to do one of these for you, I know a guy. I love that. I love that. Yeah, as far as uh, new story collections of original work, um, I'm working on a few things, but like I said, I'm kind of a slow writer, and it doesn't help when you're working 50-some hours a week. <laughs> it's hard to find the time and the energy, but uh, we'll get there eventually. 
I've got a little thing that's kind of turning into more of a novella than a short story at this point, but we'll see where that goes. I both love and hate that for you. Mm -hmm. I've been working on a Mark Temple story for the next Mark Temple collection, and it was going great. And about 8,000 words in, I realized Mark has a much bigger story to tell. And I'm mm -hmm. grateful, think it's cool, but I'm mad at the little the dude. It was like, dude, I wanted to get this story done. <laughs> Not only are you telling me this is a bigger story, but now I've got to rewrite the first 8,000 words. It's like, what are you doing to me, man? So, I, Yeah, it's, it's yeah. funny that stories have a life of their own. Right? We are the mouthpieces for our characters, but our characters don't always do what we want them to do the writer is not always in control they're they're jerks they're <laughs> i and and i i tell this to him to his face mark temple you're a jerk okay i just want to get this story done but no <laughs> when this movie was released at one point at least according to one website that i saw there was talk of a sequel would you consider sequelizing something like this or any of the public domain movies you're thinking about? Well, now I am. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as soon as we got done recording, Brian and I realized that something we said in the conversation we had wasn't necessarily true. He said it was his first non-kaiju appearance here on Monster Kid Radio, and I was like, yeah, sure, of course, that's, that's true. No, that's not true. We actually talked about a movie from the 70s called The Dunwich Horror, which I really love and will probably end up watching this weekend uh, because it's the weekend of the Lovecraft Film Festival and I'm not able to go and there's a whole thing there. It's really kind of bumming me out. So to try to uh, get over that disappointment, I think I'm going to watch The Dunwich Horror. It's been a couple of years since I've seen it. Probably the last time I saw it was when I talked about it with Brian Clark on the show. Yeah! <laughs> the unspeakable. Yeah! Stop her! She invites it. The Dunwich Horror, based on H.P. Lovecraft's terrifying tale of those who explore the supernatural. <laughs> Sandra D. Dean Stockwell, Ed Begley, Sam Jaffe, in The Dunwich Horror. So, yeah, The Dunwich Horror. We talked about that, but then Brian's mostly a kaiju guy. But still, I have a blast chatting with him, regardless of the movie or the subject matter. So anyway, wanted to throw that out there just to kind of self-correct before we got too far away from this episode. I want to thank everybody for participating in this week's show. It was awesome to have Jeff back in the mix. Don't know how often he's going to be able to pull that off or how often he's going to go to Weird Wednesday, partly because Weird Wednesday isn't as regular as he used to be. But anytime Jeff wants to call in with a Weird Wednesday report, you know, I'd love to have it here. In fact, listeners, if you go to an event and you want to call in a report, I would love to include it here on the show. We should come up with a special name for the segment, and I'll find some special music to play along, and yeah, it'll be fun. Call in that segment to 360-524-2484. If you have to call in more than once because that voicemail has a three-minute limit, that's okay. I'll stitch it all together. I had to do that with Jeff's voicemail, and no problem. I don't think anybody could tell until I just said something just now. Or you can record an audio file and send it to monsterkidradio at gmail.com. I take waves, MP3s, and, well, pretty much anything else. And here's a little secret. You know how Kenny gets the audio to me for the Famous Monsters of Film Line segment? He uploads it to YouTube as an unlisted video and then just sends me the link. So that's another way you can get audio feedback to the show is doing it that way. Speaking of the Famous Monsters segment, Kenny, thanks for sending that in. Again, show is better when you're on it. And Mark, dude, the Beta Capsule Review, The Return of Ultraman, I love Ultraman so much. I know that we did Kaiju July, but you know, you gotta keep that Kaiju flavor going, man. You gotta, just gotta keep it going. I love me some Ultraman. Okay, so I've mentioned the website a couple of times, monsterkidradio.net, where you're gonna find everything you need to know about Monster Kid Radio between episodes, including that link, that Amazon affiliate button. If you wanna buy Brian's book or place a pre-order for the Beast from Haunted Cave on Blu-ray, again, please consider using those links because it helps me out a little bit. And trust me when I say this, every little bit helps. Oh, uh, money's really tight right now. You know, if you listened to the last installment or upload to the Monster Kid Radio feed, where we talked about how we're not associated with 
a particular haunt anymore. Not only are we no longer involved with that haunt, but we're not getting paid by that haunt anymore. And money's tight, man. Patreon made it possible for me to put gas in the car this week. I'm just saying. Speaking of which, we do have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash Monster Kid Radio. You can also find links to that as well as our Reddit, our Discord, our Facebook page, our Facebook group, and our Twitter on our website. You're also going to find a link to the band that we're playing this week, Frankie's Chop Shop. Why are we playing Frankie's Chop Shop this week? And why are we going to play something else from the band next week? It's because Chris Alexander from the band Frankie's Chop Shop will be here next week. He and I are going to have a chat about Basil Gogos. We're going to talk about the iconic illustrator, painter from Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. I cannot wait to talk about Basil Gogos with Chris Alexander, mostly because, one, I get to talk to a musician whose music I really, really like, but two, I don't know as much about Basil Gogos as I'd like. I really don't. You know, you'd think that being a big old monster kid like me, I'd know a little bit more about this guy than I do, but I really don't. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. That's scheduled to happen sometime next week, and that is going to be on next week's episode of the podcast. So stay tuned for that. Until next week, remember, Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio, LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song Go Dracula Go. That is copyright 2021, Frankie's Chop Shop. You can find them at frankieschopshop.bandcamp.com or on Facebook. Check out the album. Let them know that Monster Kid Radio sent you. I will talk to you, everybody, next week where you need to hear more Frankie's Chop Shop and Chris Alexander from the band when we talk about Basil Gogos. My name's Sarah Kim Cook. Ciao. I am Dracula. really dead. That must be glorious.
does not live even a single lifetime. You are a wise man, Ben Alpine. 